uh, we start the link reaction as we did glycolysis uh, in the previous lectures and uh, we're going to now do the link reaction in the link reaction as you remember uh, the six carbon glucose the six carbon glucose is broken down by the process of glycolysis into two three carbon pyruvate now as you can see in the diagram that the outer membrane of the mitochondrion the outer membrane of the mitochondrion is this one it contains a channel protein which i have made in red because this pyruvate cannot enter the phospholipid bilayer so it has to enter through a channel protein so this would be facilitated diffusion and it enters passes through the inner membrane and then ultimately is converted the three carbon pyruvate is converted to two carbon acetyl coa acetyl coa and what we have to remember is that and something is going to happen here and that is an exiting a carbon dioxide now what we need to understand is that uh, the three carbon pyruvate the three carbon pyruvate is converted into acetyl this is an acetate group what we need to add here is a coenzyme a so this coenzyme a makes this molecule now acetyl coenzyme a but during this process when three carbon becomes two carbon one carbon is lost as carbon dioxide now this is going to happen twice because we had two pyruvates so we're going to have two acetyl coas but during this time also one another thing happens is that hydrogen is removed from this pyruvate and that hydrogen so that means dehydrogenation takes place and the hydrogen is given to a coenzyme called nad and this nad is converted to nadh and this h has come from the pyruvate or you can use the word you can say reduced nad now this whole process is going to take place twice because we had two pyruvates so we're going to have two acetyl coa so what you need to understand in the link reaction is that the three carbon pyruvate is converted to two carbon acetyl coenzyme a what we need to understand is that in the krebs cycle the two carbon acetyl coa which came from the link reaction combines with four carbon oxaloacetate this was already present in the matrix of the mitochondrion so the four carbon combines with two carbon and forms a six carbon citrate so we we'll need an enzyme for this and this coenzyme a will be released so it is the two carbon acetate which has been brought to the krebs cycle by the by combining with coenzyme a so the four carbon oxaloacetate was already present in the matrix of the mitochondrion it combines with two carbon acetyl coa and forms six carbon citrate the six carbon citrate then is converted to six carbon isocitrate the six carbon isocitrate then is converted into five carbon and here of course a carbon dioxide is going to exit but also here a hydrogen is also removed so nadh is formed or with other word for that is reduced nad so 6 carbon to 5 carbon and then 5 carbon to 4 carbon again now again you can see here that another carbon dioxide will exit and another nadh will exit now what we need to understand is that the 6 carbon to 5 carbon is decarboxylation then 5 carbon to 4 carbon is again decarboxylation so 
Now, in the Krebs cycle, the 4 carbon to 2 carbon forms 6 carbon citrate. 6 carbon citrate forms 6 carbon isocitrate because that makes it more reactive. Now, I don't want you to remember the names after this. So, after 6 carbon, then you have 5 carbon and then 5 carbon to 4 carbon. And now what you have to understand is that the 4 carbon continues. And as I told you the other day, you have to write this 5 times. So 1, 2, 3, 4, totally it has to be 5 times. Now in the next step, in the next step, you see, what you have to understand is the next step is ATP is going to be formed. So ADP to ATP is being formed and this is called substrate level phosphorylation. And then we have, in the next step, we have FADH being formed. FADH is another coenzyme. So again, dehydrogenation has taken place. So dehydrogenation takes place whenever NADH or FADH is formed. So this will be FAD to FADH. And then just before oxaloacetate is regenerated, we have another NADH being formed. So NAD, say ab NADH ban gaya. So we have NADH three times. NADH being formed three times. And FADH once. And carbon dioxide twice. So we have, in one Krebs cycle, we have two carbon dioxide. We have three NADH and one FADH. So you multiply this whole thing by two. Now let's fill up this table. As you can see, this table has come in many of your uh, papers as well. Now in glycolysis, if we remember, no carbon dioxide was produced. NADH2 were produced, no FADH was produced. And a net gain of 2 ATP or 4 ATPs were produced. In the link reaction we had because one glucose gave you 2 pyruvate. So 2 carbon dioxide. And as each one gave you 1 NADH. So 2 NADH. No FADH, no ATP. In the Krebs cycle we had in one cycle. If you remember. In one cycle we had 2 CO2. So in this we will have 4 CO2. But CO2 is of no good to us because carbon dioxide is just going to diffuse out of the mitochondria and out of the cell. NADH if you remember were 3. So 2 times so this would mean 6. FADH was 1 so this would be 2. And ATP was 1 so this would be 2 again because you see each time is going to be twice. So we have 6 carbon dioxide. This will of course diffuse out. NADH, if you look now, are 10. And every NADH is going to give you 3 ATP. So if we divide, multiply this by 3, so we have 30 ATPs. And every FADH, every FADH gives you 2 ATP. That's a reason because they have more energy and less energy. So 2 into 2 means 4. So 30 plus 4. And because we have a net gain of 2 here and 2 here, so we have 4 APs from this. So 30 plus 4 plus 4. Now this is going to give you 38 ATP molecules. So one glucose at the end of it is going to give you 3 ATP molecules. And this is how we have to understand that one glucose is equal to 38 ATP molecules. And this, of course, involves all the three processes, all the four processes. Number one, glycolysis. Number two, link reaction. Number three, Krebs cycle. And number four is ETC, which is, of course, also called oxidative phosphorylation. Now we come to ETC. Now for ETC, you've got to remember is that the process has to take place on the inner membrane. And you know the inner membrane is folded. 
The inner membrane is folded and this is where the electron transport chain is going to occur and here what we have is we've got channel proteins. There are three of these. And then there is one which is the most important one which is a large channel protein but it acts as an enzyme as well. And this has a name called ATP synthase. And what is going to happen here is that NADH is going to give up its hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to split into a proton and an electron. Electron is going to be shuttled across the membrane. And finally, it is going to get attached to oxygen. And that is why we say oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So there are electron carriers and the electron is going to be shuttled across the membrane and finally get attached to oxygen. But during this process, during this time, these protons are going to be pumped into the intermembrane space. So what do we have here? We have a lot of hydrogen. So there's a lot of hydrogen in the intermembrane space. This is called the intermembrane space. Intermembrane space. And then there is another word that we use a lot. We say this is causes a proton gradient. It forms a proton gradient. Now, what does it mean a proton gradient? It means that we have the outer membrane and then this is the inner membrane and we have a whole lot of hydrogen ions here. And there are none here in the matrix. So what is going to happen is they only have one channel protein for them. And that is the ATP synthase molecule. So they cannot come back, they cannot go out because the outer membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. This outer membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So it cannot pass through the hydrophobic part. So this hydrophobic area is not protons because ions are. So now the hydrogen ions cannot go out. They cannot come back in into the matrix. This is the matrix. They cannot come back in. So they have only one way through which they can pass and that is through the ATP synthase. Now the ATP synthase when they come down through the ATP synthase they help in catalyzing a reaction. The ADP plus the inorganic phosphate combine and form ATP. This formation of ATP is called oxidative phosphorylation. And why does ADP and inorganic phosphate combine is I usually give you an analogy is K hydro what is hydroelectric power water flows flows across the turbines and the turbines generate electricity. So the hydrogen ions which are going to pass through the ATP synthase molecule is going to realize there is an active site at the base of the ATP synthase where ADP and inorganic phosphate is going to combine. But that is why this is also called the proton motive force. Proton motive force meaning that the protons sort of like is working like the water, just like we say hydroelectric power. The movement of the protons through the ATP synthase is going to result in the catalysis and ADP and inorganic phosphate is going to combine to form ATP. And this formation of ATP is called oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if you remember, we also studied substrate level phosphorylation. Now, this substrate level only took place. This is also formation of ATP. This may be ATP. Like that was only in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle. 